Uh, I need to say that this course, this, this course is possible uh, uh, is possible uh, thanks to uh, the Israeli embassy uh, in Ukraine and uh, our partners uh, from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, of course. So many thanks to them. And uh, what about this course? A uh, few, just a few words. <coughs> you will have uh, six classes. Uh, on Monday, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, and some of you will pass the exam. I mean the, the first year master's students. I mean the first year master's students. Uh, you, you know about this. And I believe that you're ready uh, to have the first exam in English in your life. Uh, Okay, <laughs> uh, um, small piece of information for, for our guests that, as usually, all our uh, guest mini courses and all our uh, guest public lectures, all our guest events are open, so you can um, ask your questions as mm -hmm. others. So, feel free. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Professor Rosman, for coming. Uh, you're welcome for this course, and okay. please. Okay, thank you, Vitaly. Thank you for inviting me. I was last in Kiev in 1995. I taught at a place called the Solomon University. I don't think it exists anymore. Uh, I was here for a whole semester. I also worked in the archives, so it's very interesting for me to come back now after 20 years and see that there's still Jewish studies, and now in the Moila Academy, founded 1615, um, very impressive. Our course is about conflicts in Jewish history in the early modern period. How many of you have studied any course in Jewish history? Okay, about half, good. Uh, I thought that we should begin discussing the early modern period of Jewish history to get some kind of foundation and then talk about conflict, what do we mean by conflict, and then we will examine some examples of conflicts in uh, Jewish life in the early modern period. So, first of all, what do we mean by the early modern period? Roughly speaking, for Jewish history, it's between the expulsion from Spain, which was in 1492, until the partitions of Poland at the end of the 18th century. So we can say the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, roughly 1500 to 1800. Just if I'm speaking too quickly or you don't understand a word that I say, please ask, okay? Because uh, Jews, almost 100% of the Jews lived in a ellipse. Oh, you can't see it. Okay. In an ellipse that starts, let's say, in... Uh, Morocco, and goes to what is today Iran, and back north of the Sahara Desert. Virtually all of the Jews in the world lived in this area. Note, they didn't live in Spain, because they were expelled from Spain in 1492, and from Portugal uh, in 1497. They were forced to convert. Uh, on the other hand, England, which had expelled the Jews in 1290, readmitted them in the 1650s. France, which had expelled the Jews in the 14th century, also readmitted them at the end of the 17th century. In other words, the medieval expulsions 
were being reversed in the early modern period. Jews who had been forced to go east, beginning in the uh, 17th century, they're coming back west. Now, so they all live in this area, and it's just interesting to compare the early modern period to the modern period. If we looked at this map 200 years later in 1900, it would be much different. By 1900, Jews are living in uh, North and South America, South Africa, uh, Australia, and then of course after 1950, the map is much different yet. And after 1950, uh, you no longer have Jews in North Africa or in Western Asia. And uh, of course, there was the, the Shoah, the Holocaust, so the number of Jews in Europe was greatly reduced. So the geography of Jewish life tells you a lot about the history of Jewish life. Anyway, 1700, virtually all the Jews are in this ellipse. Now, what's important is not only where they live, but in what kind of settlement they live. And we can talk grossly about three different types of Jewish settlement in this period. First of all, we have village and small town Jews. That is, Jews who live uh, in what later we call the shtetl, uh, a small town. There's a lot of that's been written about what is a shtetl, how to define the shtetl. Uh, maybe we can get into that later if you want to ask about it. So, a shtetl basically is a small town with a very large Jewish population, usually a majority Jewish population. And of course, uh, Ukraine is one of the main places where you will find such places. But also, for example, southern Germany, there were many village and small town Jews in the early modern period. Then there are ghetto Jews. In the early modern period, starting in 1517, we have the first official ghetto. And where is that? Take a guess. Good thing you came today. In Germany. No. The first official ghetto. And when I say ghetto, I mean a place where there's a wall with a gate that's locked at night, where Jews must live, and every night they're locked in. That's a ghetto. The first official ghetto is? Where in Italy? Venice, Venezia. The first official ghetto is in Venice. After that, ghettos spread throughout Italy and Germany. So in the 16th century, we have the first real ghettos. Where don't we have ghettos? We don't have ghettos in Eastern Europe. We have uh, Jewish uh, quarters, Jewish neighborhoods, places of concentrated Jewish settlement, but we do not have ghettos. We don't have a wall with a gate that's locked at night. Now we also have Jews in big cities, places like uh, Lviv, Krakow, uh, Venezia, uh, but they're, they're in a the ghetto. But play, Jews in big cities, uh, Amsterdam, where they, there is a Jewish quarter, but they are very much part of the city life. Now, just to complicate things, let's take the example of Krakow. How many of you have been to Krakow? It's a nice city, you should see it. Well, in Krakow, the Jews were officially expelled from Krakow in, 14, in 1595. 1595, I'm sorry, 1495. 1495 Jews are not allowed to live in Krakow, okay? So, if you read in the history book Jews expelled from Krakow, what do you think? That, uh, that's it, they sent them away. Where did they wind up? Maybe they came to Kiev. But that's not what happened. Because when they were expelled from Krakow, which is here, this is a picture of Krakow in the 18th century, where did they go? They walked across the river 
to Kashmir's, which today is very much a part of Prabhu. In fact, there's no river here anymore. They, they just, the river is only here, not here anymore. Uh, and you can walk from here, which is the heart of the old city of Prabhu, the Sukhyanitsa, to here, where there are six synagogues on one street, you can walk here in less than 15 minutes. So, when we say the Jews were expelled from Krakow, it doesn't really mean that there are no Jews in Krakow because they're a 15 minute walk away. So when you need them, they're there. So, I'm trying to make the point that uh, the situation is, is much more complex than we think sometimes. This is an old picture of the same thing. You see, Kajimej, Krafu, very close. And Kajimej is where the Jews lived until the Shoah. Okay. Now, something else about geography. You know, we say geography is destiny. Geography is destiny. Where you, where you are determines, to a great extent, what kind of life you're going to have. Well, Jewish geography in the early modern period is typified by a few things. First of all, there's mobility. In this period, Jews are on the move. And this, of course, has to do with the fact that in this period, governments are becoming uh, more organized. There's new technology, especially uh, having to do with uh, sea travel, uh, navigation. This is the age of discovery. So it's easier to travel. It's safer to travel. And Jews travel. Uh, let's take an example of a lady named Glickel. Glickel of Hamlin. Anybody hear of Glickel? Good that you came today. <laughs> Glickel. Her name was Glickel Bas Yehuda, Glickel, daughter of Yehuda. Uh, she was born in 1646. She lived uh, most of her life in Hamburg, but she married a man from Hamlin, you know, the Pied Piper of Hamlin, so everybody loves to call her Glickel of Hamlin because if the Pied Piper lived, he lived 450 years before her, but okay. So Glickel uh, was in business with her husband. She also found time to have 13 children, 11 of whom lived, which was very unusual in those days for 11 out of 13 to live. And uh, she and her husband Chaim conducted a very lively trade business. He unfortunately died in his 40s, leaving her a widow with all these children. Uh, she managed to support them, to marry them off. Uh, she was very proud of that. And uh, until finally she decided, uh, when she was in her 50s, to remarry. And this was a big mistake. As she writes in her memoirs, I had to fall into the hands of a man. A man! The necklace, the golden necklace, the golden chain that he gave me as an engagement present turned out to be a ball and chain. What happened? She married Hertz Levy, the richest man and the richest Jew in Alsace. But he had chutzpah. What did he do? He went bankrupt. <laughs> now, why do I bring up Blickel? Blickel wrote her memoirs, which is a terrific book. I highly recommend it. She wrote it in Yiddish Deutsch. Uh, sort of like Yiddish. There is a, a very good translation into Hebrew. Once you master Hebrew, you can read it. <coughs> there are two translations into English. One is good, one is bad. The good one is by Beth Zion Abrahams. Beth Zion Abrahams. Anyway, in her memoir, she describes traveling all over Europe as if there are no borders you get the sense that her country is something called Ashkenaz, this Jewish country that stretches from France to Poland. And uh, she travels, her children travel, uh, 
And this is very typical of Jews in this period. Uh, first of all, we have many refugees and expellees in this period. Uh, the Jews were expelled from Spain and Portugal in the, at the end of the 15th century, in the 16th century, and still in the 17th century. Many of them are still looking for a permanent place. In the 17th century, we still have uh, Jews who are new Christians, who in the fourth generation, their great-grandchildren of the people who originally converted come back to the Jewish community. Uh, so a good example of this, Benedict Baruch Spinoza. His, he is the grandchild of Jews who converted in Portugal, and his parents decided to return to Judaism in Amsterdam. So we have lots of Jews uh, going back and forth. Uh, the Thirty Years' War, uh, which ended in 1648, there's lots of people running away from war, including many Jews. And then, of course, the Chmielnitsky Wars here, and from 1648 till 1658, create tremendous numbers of Jewish refugees who are going west, looking for a safe place. So there's lots of movement. And then there are all kinds of entrepreneurs like Gligel and Chaim of Hamlin. There are rabbis who are trained in the east, trained in uh, Poland, what is today Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, and looking for jobs, go west to Germany. Also, uh, people in the printing trade go to Germany, go to Amsterdam, go to Italy. All kinds of opportunity seekers going from the west to the east. Excuse me, from the east to the west. And of course, when people move, ideas move with them. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so if geography is destiny, demography is reality. What's the Jewish demography around 1700? The entire European population is approximately 100 million people. 100 million people. Think about it. All of Europe is about twice the population of today's Ukraine. So. Uh, the scale is much different from what we're used to thinking about. Um, France and Ukraine together equal all of Europe. Anyway, the Jewish population is only about 1% of that in 1700. And how are they divided up? Well, about 18% of them, of the Jews, are in Western Europe. That means up until Poland. Somewhat more than half a million are in what we call Eastern Europe. That is today's Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania. Well, uh, Belarus, I should say. I have to be careful with my national loyalties here. When I think Lithuania, I think big Lithuania, which of course we're not allowed to think about anymore. So, uh, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, okay? Give everybody there. Uh, and the Balkans. And I won't get into that. Uh, Western Asia, right? Palestine, uh, Iran, today's Iraq, uh, about 200,000. North Africa, also close to 200,000. And then a few thousand spread out over uh, Oceania, that is the South Pacific. Now let's talk about Jewish economy in this period. There was an economist named Simon Kuznets who actually won the Nobel Prize in economics. He also happened to be Jewish and he wrote a very important article about the economy of the Jews. 
He didn't win the Nobel Prize for that. The Economy of the Jews. And his basic thesis is, if you think of the economy of any country as a checkerboard, there's a rule. A minority will be found in the squares of the checkerboard where the majority, A, doesn't want to be, and B, allows the minority to be. And this is a pretty good rule wherever you have majority, minority, if you think about it. A minority will be where the majority doesn't want to be and where the, min the majority allows them to be, which means minorities will tend to be in squares of the checkerboard that are risky, that are socially not very uh, acceptable or pleasant, uh, and that tend to be new, because new means risky. Nobody knows how it's going to wind up. So think, for example, <coughs> Jews and money lending. This is something that uh, has a stigma attached to it. It's not very socially acceptable. So we'll let the Jews do it. Now, in addition, Kuznets points out, once the minority gets a foothold in one of these squares of the checkerboard, it's magnetic. Members of the minority who succeed in a certain area are magnets and bring other members of the same minority with them. And the more members of the minority that get into that square, the fewer of the majority want to be in that square. So, the economic distribution of minority is always abnormal. By which I mean if you take the rest of the checkerboard and you see what's the average number of uh, people we have in each, in each uh, square, the minority is going to be much lower in all of the other squares and much higher in these few squares. And that's the way the uh, economy of the Jews looks in most places in the early modern period. So, now let's talk some details. This is a, an engraving from the 17th century in Poland. Uh, credit is dead. <laughs> Who killed it? And is now at the funeral? All of these different occupations in Poland. So one occupation is aptekaj, that's a, a pharmacist. Uh, one is the kravietz, the uh, tailor. Uh, one is malaj, the painter. And we also have an occupation known as zhid. That's an <laughs> occupation. And I would ask you to note how the zhid is dressed. It's not a shtrimel and kapata. So that's a subject for a different lecture. But uh, uh, Also, ormian. Ormianin is another uh, occupation. In other words, there are certain occupations that Jews do. What are those? Well, first of all, there's money lending. Uh, and that's something Jews did in the Middle, East, Middle Ages. But, interesting, in the early modern period, Jews do less money lending, especially in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, uh, again, all those places I mentioned before, today it's Poland, Ukraine, uh, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, all those places, uh, Jews still tended to deal in uh, petty money lending, especially Jewish women. And how do I know that? Because if a lender wanted to redeem a pawn, how do you say pawn in Ukrainian? Pawn? Pawn. What, when I lend you money, you give me something as security. What is that? Okay. 
So, uh, when I had to redeem it, I had to ask the court for permission. And if you go over the court cases of the people asking permission to redeem the pawn, uh, the majority, the large majority, are women. And why women? That's, uh, again, a subject for another lecture. Maybe you invite me back. Okay. Uh, actually, Jews are much more borrowers than lenders in the early modern period in the form of the Jewish community. The Jewish community is borrowing money from church institutions and from nobles. Why? Well, there are no banks yet. I mean, in the real modern sense of a bank. So, if I'm a nobleman, and I'm collecting all kinds of money, I'm collecting taxes, I'm collecting custom duties, I'm collecting, uh, I'm making money from my uh, latifundia. What do I do with the money? Just let it sit there? I want to invest it. I want my money to make money. Well, one way, one good way to make money is lend it to the Jewish community, which is a very good borrower. Why? Because they can't run away. The Jewish community is going to be there. Also, the same thing, uh, a monastery. They're getting all sorts of donations. Every Sunday they get donations. And monasteries also have latifundia attached to them. And they're making money. Again, what do I do with the money? Just leave it in a chest somewhere? No. I'll lend it to the Jewish community. Now, interest is very low. It's like today. Interest on these loans are 2%, 3%. But there's a catch. And the catch is these kinds of loans are called Viderkauf. Viderkauf. Okay? Because all three. All three monotheistic religions forbid lending on interest. And all three found a way to do it anyway. And the way the Christians did is Viderkauf. That is, I don't lend you the money. I rent you the money. You're paying rent on the money. And you never return the principal. You just keep paying rent on the principal, which is why the interest is so low, because you're paying it forever. I, I'm seeing with my own eyes records of loans made in the 1660s, 1660s, in the, 16, in the 1740s, 80 years later, Jewish communities are still paying interest on those loans. Now, in 1660, when I took the loan, I took a thousand zloty, I'm paying 2% interest, it's a joke. Okay, I'm paying 20 zloty a year. Nothing. But if I borrow every year a thousand zlotis, after 20 years, 30 years, it's not a joke anymore. It's serious money. And then I start borrowing money to pay the interest on the money that I borrowed before. So Jewish communities start going bankrupt. For example, uh, the Jewish community of Lublin essentially went bankrupt in 1707. And the creditors threatened, uh, they closed the synagogue, and they threatened to confiscate the silver ornaments of the Torah and sell it, sell them. So what did the Jews do? What did the Jews do to prevent this? I can't hear you. Like forgetting debts or something like that. Nope. They sent representatives to Western Europe to oh. get donations. Yeah. They went to Frankfurt. They went to Amsterdam. They went to Venice. Okay, they said, letter once again. What? The key of letter, once again. Yes. <laughs> exactly. 
That's, that's what Jews do. If we don't have money, we're going to get other Jews to give us the money. Okay. <coughs> I'm getting too enthusiastic. The time is going. Okay. Commerce. Jews deal in commerce on every level. From the peddler who goes from village to village buying uh, the extra products that the uh, serfs have. Uh, they made some cheese. They made some cloth. Uh, they have some eggs to sell. Whatever it might be. It doesn't pay for the peasant to go to the market himself. He doesn't have enough. But if a Jew goes to, around to ten villages and collects the stuff, then he takes it to the market. There's local markets. There's fairs. There's the larger cities. And then there's the international fairs in uh, Leipzig, in Frankfurt. So Jews are involved at every level. In general, we can say what Jews do is to connect the agricultural sector to the market. So on the one hand, they, they buy up agricultural produce from peasants, and also from the great latifundia, when market conditions are not good, Jews can be an alternative way to market whatever the latifundium produces. And then, Jews bring back into the countryside, into the cities and in the countryside, things that are not manufactured locally. Uh, high quality cloth, spices, special food, tools, luxury goods, and come back and they're marketed again from the international fair to the big cities, to the regional fairs, to the towns, to the local markets, to the peasants. And, and in addition, of course, Jews are in injecting cash into the local economy. Excuse me? Yes. Uh, so what was the occupation of the Jewish man on that Polish painting once again? Because there was this other person who was a kupiec. Yes. Was a sailor, a salesman, a tradesman. Uh, right. So who was this? Well, the Jew is competing with him. Oh, okay. Okay. So we, have, we always have this competition, and we're going to see okay. this in one of our cases competition between the Christian townsmen, who are merchants, and the Jewish merchants. But wasn't he rather thought to be a money lender, money borrower, or something? Like Not this? in the 17th century. Uh, that wouldn't be the... the more typical would be what's coming. Arenda. Okay. Okay. That's, that's the typical Jew. Uh, so, to the extent that Jid and Arendaj uh, are uh, synonyms. Uh, so I, I would also you have to understand something else today you say I am a lawyer I am a doctor I am a teacher okay I am a saleswoman whatever they didn't do that I could be an arendage uh, all the time which we'll talk about in a minute uh, when the nobleman pays me, I might become a money lender. Uh, I then might take that money and buy some merchandise and market it. So sometimes I'm a merchant, sometimes I'm a money lender. Uh, so it's, it's very fluid categories. Which is also the reason why it's jid. <laughs> okay, leasing. Arenda. What is arenda? So we have two basic kinds of arenda. We have leasing of land. Uh, do you say in Ukrainian kluch? A unit of a latifundium. In Polish it's kluch. I don't know what it is. So we'll have a, a town or two and t 10 or 20 villages around it, right? So that's a kluch. And uh, I might lease the entire kluch with everything on it, which means I also supervise the peasants, the labor, because I'm in charge of the agriculture. 
Uh, or we have uh, arendage generalne, which means I don't have anything to do with the land per se, I have to do with all the incomes that the latifundium produces. So uh, taxes, customs, uh, that's what I'm. Or monopolies. Uh, in every latifundium, the owner has the monopoly right to manufacture and sell liquor. The owner has the right to operate uh, grain mills to ground, grind grain. So, if I am the arendage generalni, I lease these rights. I operate all of the uh, karchmi. I operate all of the mills. And this is what we would call for the Jewish community a basic industry. A basic industry means an industry that creates jobs for other people. So if I'm a Rendaj Generalni and I have 10 Karchmen, what do I do? I lease those to 10 individual Jews. And if I have 10 mills, I lease those to 10 individual Jews. And if I have 10, uh, or three customs houses, I lease those to individuals. So the Rendaj Generalni is a basic industry for an entire Jewish community. Because all of these arendages need a tailor, a shoemaker, a shochet, that's somebody, a ritual slaughterer for their meat, uh, somebody to teach their children, a rabbi. So often the arendage generalne, or the, again, forgive me, I only know it in Polish, the zerzhavce, uh, that is the lessee of all the land, how do you say that in Ukrainian? Zerzhavce, you don't say. I always think that Ukrainian is somewhere between Russian and Polish. No, <laughs> no it's not. not something. It's related. <laughs> uh, this is the basic industry for Jews, very often. And then, artisanry. Jews go into artisanry, but here we get back to Kuznets. What kind of artisanry? Jews are, uh, first of all, in crafts that are connected to Jewish religion. Okay, I need kosher meat, I need a kosher butcher. I need, a kosher, I need kosher bread, I need a kosher baker. I need kosher clothing. You know, the Torah says you're not allowed to wear uh, what's called in English, linsey woolsey That is wool and linen together. In Hebrew, it's called shatnez, shatnez. Can I write it in Hebrew letters? Is that? Shatnez, yes. okay. Uh, so I need kosher, I need a kosher tailor. I also need a kosher barber. Because according to the Torah, I'm not allowed to use a razor on my face. I can use scissors. So modern razors are sort of like scissors, but I can't use a straight-edge razor on my face. That's why Jews traditionally had beards. So I need a kosher barber. So all of these things, if you read the privilegia that Jews get when they settle in places, they usually say, okay, you can have your own butchers and bakers and barbers and tailors because that's, your religion requires it. So that's one kind of craft Jews are in. A second kind of craft Jews are in is crafts that are related to other things Jews do. So if Jews are money lenders and they take in, again that word, pawns, let's say they take in a piece of clothing and then the loan's not repaid and they have to redeem that piece of clothing. Well, maybe it has a tear in it. If you can repair it, it's worth more. If you can attach fur to it, it's worth more. So Jews become furriers and tailors. And thirdly, what Kuznet said, Jews go into new things, new industries, because they're risky. So in the 16th century, when glass 
becomes domesticated. People start using glass uh, in their houses, windows made out of glass. Jews go into glass, which is why so many Jews are named Glazer. Because Jews were Glazers. Uh, okay. And finally, communal service. Jews are in communal service. They are rabbis. They are uh, shochatim. Again, I mentioned before, write that on the board. Shochet, ritual slaughterer of meat. They are uh, communal functionaries, which is called uh, the shkolnik in Polish. Uh, in Hebrew, the shamash, who is the uh, executive officer of the community, whatever, whatever has to be done, he's the one that does it, and various other communal functionaries. So that's what the Jewish economy looks like in the early modern period. And then we also have a Jewish polity, Jewish politics. Now you have to remember, in this period, all over the world, under Christianity and under Islam, it didn't matter. Wherever Jews lived, they had what's called autonomy, self-rule. And now I know that's a big issue in Ukrainian history, autonomy. In Jewish history, uh, it's much more, uh, shall I say, a much happier subject. Wherever Jews lived, Jewish communities had autonomy, to some extent or another. It's not the same everywhere. And what I put here, this doesn't work. Really. This, you know what this is? Prague. Right. In Prague, there is a Jewish town hall with a clock in Hebrew, and then later they added the clock with the Roman numerals. But that Hebrew clock is on the Jewish town hall, the Jewish town hall in Prague, which symbolizes the idea that the Jews had autonomy in Prague, but of course not only in Prague, everywhere. And autonomy meant there was a double leadership to the Jewish community everywhere. There is this. Now this is a page from the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. Uh, this, this happened to have been printed in Mantua in Italy in 1722. The reason I bring it here is because of these beautiful pictures of what we would call, if I, if I use the term all-star team, does that mean anything to you? All-star team? You know what an all-star team is? Vitali, can you explain what all-star team is? All-star team. Okay, I'll, I'll try to explain it. If you have a league, let's say a, a football league, and um, once a year they take the best player from each team in each division, and they play each other, that's the all-stars playing. Okay? These are the all-star rabbis. <laughs> Now, of course, these pictures are just imaginary. The artist never saw Rashi from the uh, uh, 10th century or 11th century. But he imagined what Rashi must look like, what Maimonides must look like. Uh, so I think it's cute. <laughs> now, so we always have rabbinic leadership. And this actually comes from Ukraine. Can you read this? Mezibish. Say it loud! Mezibish. 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 Why is Mezibish important? So I'll tell you a story. I went to Mezibish in 1995. And uh, there was basically nothing there. It's a very poor place. Uh, it has a tremendous fortress in ruins. It had... Uh, two churches in ruins, uh, dogs running in the street, half the streets aren't paved, chickens in the street, very poor place. Uh, 
but it has the grave of who? Whose Baal. grave is there? Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, founder of Hasidism. Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, founder of Hasidism. He's buried in Mezibush. He, he lived there for 20 years. So, a few years later, a friend of mine went there, and he saw a sign put up by the Ukrainian government because they were preparing to make Mezibush uh, a tourist attraction like Uman. You know what goes on in Uman, I assume. Uh, so they wanted to make Mezibush to be like Uman. There's going to be hotels, airports, etc., etc. So they put up a sign. You know, governments always put up a sign first. Like, uh, when they were working on the uh, light rail in Jerusalem, they, it took them 10 years, 10 years, but they put up a sign after the first year that said, we finished. And everybody's like, what do you mean you finished? <laughs> but they finished with some part of the infrastructure. So they said we finished, but it made it, it was ridiculous to put up a sign we finished. They finished nine years later. And just to, I can't resist, I have to tell you this. <laughs> the first day that it operated, I decided I'm going to take my grandchildren on the light rail so they can tell their grandchildren they were on the Jerusalem on the right, light rail the first day it was operating. So, I picked up my grandchildren, we went on the uh, one end of the line, we got on, and there's a bridge in Jerusalem, if you've been to Jerusalem, right before we get to the bridge, and the bridge was built for the uh, new train to go over. We get to the bridge, stops. No electricity, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> dead stop. My seven-year-old granddaughter says to me, they had 10 years, 10 years. They can't get it right the first day. Anyway, my friend saw the sign in Mejibuj that said, welcome to Mejibuj, home of Israel Baal Shem Tov, founder of Judaism. <laughs> Anyway, this is from Mizibush. It is the record book of the Mishnah Society of Mizibush. That is the group that every day got together to study Mishnah. You know, Mishnah is the first part of the Talmud, the oral law. So every day they got together to study Mishnah. And they had a record book. And this represents what I would call the lay leadership of the Jewish community. These are not rabbis. These are lay people. So you have lay leaders and you have rabbis. And they often conflicted. So, there's a corporate structure. The reason why Jews could have autonomy is because in this period, Government still believed in corporations. That is, in modern states, the individual citizen relates directly to the government. I pay my tax to the government. I use the courts of the government. Everything is direct from the citizen to the govern government. In the early modern period, we still have the idea of a corporation I'm not a citizen of the state. I'm a member of the corporation. As a member of the corporation, I have certain rights and certain duties because I'm in that corporation. So, if I'm a nobleman, I have noble rights and duties. If I'm a peasant, I have peasant rights and duties. And if I'm a Jew, I have Jewish rights and duties. So, as a Jew, I am subject to the Jewish corporation, the Jewish community, what Jews call Kehillah, the Kehillah, the Jewish community. Now, this community, I don't have a choice. Oh, actually, I do have a choice. My choice is this. 
I, I can be Jewish or I can be Christian. I can be Jewish or I can be Muslim. That's my choice. Okay, you want to be Christian? Please. Oh, you want to stay Jewish? Okay. Then you must, must be a member of the Jewish community. You don't have a choice. You don't want to be a, Jew a member of the Jewish community? Please. What's your next step? Jewish. Baptism. Then you don't have to be a member of the Jewish community. But if you don't want to convert, you must be a member of the Jewish community, which means you have to tell them, or you have to do what they tell you to do. They decide what it means to be Jewish, not you. And what's the most famous example of a person who said, that's what you think, who didn't want to accept the Jewish community and still didn't convert? Famous example in this period. Who is it? Spinoza. 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 Right? He didn't convert. He died as a Jew in name. But he was expelled from the Jewish community because he refused to accept their authority. There are many who call him the first secular Jew. That's a little problematic, but that's another lecture. Anyway, as we said, the Jewish community, there's double authority. Lay and rabbinic. Uh, what are the responsibilities of the Jewish communal structure? So first of all, and most important, the government supports Jewish autonomy. The government is in favor of Jewish autonomy. The, Jew the government approves of Jewish autonomous institutions. Why is that? Because governments want two things. Money and peace and quiet. <laughs> what is the most efficient way of making sure that there is law and order on the Jewish street? Let the Jews take care of it. And what's the most efficient way of getting money from the Jews? You go to the Jewish leaders and you say, okay, we want a quarter million zlotis from you this year, or whatever it is, marks, and uh, you take care of collecting it. So, the government says, we'll support you. What do we want in return? Make sure the Jews behave themselves, don't make trouble, and collect the money. Okay? The Jewish community, then, the Kehillah, uses that authority to A, run courts courts that are uh, headed by rabbis that judge Jews according to Jewish law. They also enforce communal discipline. Uh, in this period, I'm sure you've seen pictures of people in the stocks like this. What do you call that in Ukrainian? You tell me. <laughs> you know, the 17th, 18th century, usually in America, you see in the witch trials people in the stocks. So. What? Kaidane. Okay, so we have something in Yiddish called the kune, kune, which means a pole with handcuffs on it in front of the synagogue. And if you did something wrong, they put you in the kuna, and people pass by, and they spit at you, they threw eggs at you. And you were there for half a day, day, two days, whatever your punishment was. The Jewish community also provides services, education, schools, charity, all kinds of charitable organizations, uh, synagogue. Kosher slaughter. The Jewish community has to provide all of these services for its members. And the leaders of the Jewish community are elected. But it's not quite what we would call democratic. It's sort of democratic. You know, people in Eastern Europe have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, 
what does that mean? It's really oligarchic. Uh, I won't get into all the details now, but basically the system is uh, has democratic elements in it, but then the democratic elements are connected to uh, lottery and to uh, oligarchy, that is, a few powerful people in the end make the decision. Which is typical, not just of the Jewish community, but of all politics in the early modern period, and maybe some places in the postmodern period. <laughs> Now, there's also something called shtadlanut. Shtadlanut, we would, that's a Hebrew word, we translate uh, lobbying. Do you understand what I mean by a lobbyist? Yeah. Lobbying? Okay. So, the Jewish community always has at least one shtadlan, a lobbyist. Somebody who represents Jewish interests at the court, at the seat of power. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about Jewish culture in the early modern period. Jewish culture. So I have two pictures here. This is another, a different edition of the Shulchan Aruch. This one was printed in Krakow uh, in the 16th century. This book is unique in Jewish history. Now, you know, there's a lot of books the Jews wrote, a lot of books. But there is no book in Jewish history like this one before this one. This book is called, if you can see it, Shir HaMa'alot David, which is a play on the biblical psalms. There's a series of psalms. Shir HaMa'alot David, David's Song of Ascents, of Ascent, going up. Uh, there's a series of them in the Book of Psalms. This book was written by a man named David Darshan, David Darshan, David the preacher. And so he did a little play on words, and he called his book Shir HaMa'alot David, not the King David, but David the preacher. David. Song of a sense. But this is really a song of his virtues. It's a book about D David's virtues. Again, not King David, but David Darshan's virtues. What are his virtues? This book, David Darshan says, uh, I have daughters. They need to get married. <laughs> In order for them to get married, I need to give them dowries. And I don't have enough money. But I do have something. Since I'm 19 years old, I've been collecting books. Collecting books. He wrote this uh, 25 years later, so he was 44. Uh, he said, I have 400 books. We're talking about 1571. 1571, 400 books. How many books is that? Well, I'll give you an idea. 60 years later, in 1636, 1636, which is 21 years after the Mohila Academy was founded, <laughs> another, another rather well-known university was founded. You know which one I'm talking about? I guess it's not as famous as the Mohila Academy. Harvard University. Oh. <laughs> Harvard University. Do you know how many books were in the Harvard Library in 1638? 400. 60 years before that, this Polish Jew in Krakow had the same number of books that Harvard University opened its doors with. So 400 books is a lot of books. Okay? And David Darshan says, Here's what I'm going to do for you. If you accept me to your Jewish community, I'm going to set up a special Beit Midrash. 
You know what a Beit Midrash is? Yeah. If you want to see one, you can go to uh, the synagogue in Fadol. Next door to it is a Beit Midrash. Beit Midrash is a study hall. A study hall where Jews sit and study. But this Beit Midrash is going to be different. In this Beit Midrash, I'm going to put my 400 books. And look, I'm not a big scholar. Okay, I studied with important scholars, but I, I know I'm not uh, the greatest scholar. But what I will do is I commit myself to be there every day, and people come, read the books, and if they have trouble understanding something, I'll try to help them understand it. And if they have a question, I'll write down the question, and I'll send it to the head of the yeshiva to answer it. And teachers, teachers, teachers don't have any time to read books. So once a week, I'll have the teachers gather, and I'll summarize a book for them. I'm sure you've never heard of such things. Uh, just give me the place, and give me uh, a modest salary, plus... Not only this, I can do other things. Uh, I can write letters. If you need to write a letter to somebody, I'll write it for you. Not everybody could write a letter in those days. Uh, I can also decide simple questions of halakha, Jewish law. Here's two examples of responsa that I wrote, deciding questions of Jewish law. I can do that. Uh, I can also, of course, my name is David Darshan, I can preach, I can give sermons. Here's a couple examples of my sermons. So what is this book? This book is not a book that you take to read. This book is his portfolio. <laughs> Here's what I can do for you. It's advertising. There is no such book in Jewish history until now, 1571. Why? Why? Why now? The printing. Print. If he had to do it by hand, how many copies could he make of this? But if he can print a few hundred copies and send them out, somebody somewhere is going to say, hey, we need a guy like this. So print, and I use David Darshan as an example of how print revolutionized culture everywhere, of course, but especially in, among the Jews. You know, everyone, when print came out, there was controversy everywhere. Should we adopt print or not? Uh, the first Islamic press did not exist until 1737. Because the Muslims said, if it's not written by hand, it's not genuine, it's not authentic. I'll give you another example. The United States Constitution. The United States Constitution was written in 1787. 1787. That's several hundred years after print was invented, right? The, the Constitution was written by hand in several copies. There are several handwritten copies of the United States Constitution, okay? And this is uh, 400 years after print is invented, 500 years after print? No, for, no, what am I saying? 300 years, 350 years after print, okay? If you look at the drafts of the Constitution, you know what I mean by the drafts? Mm -hmm. No. What drafts Signature. of the Constitution? Um, signature. Signature. What? Signature. No. no. Chernetka. Okay. Chernetka. Okay. <laughs> if you look at the drafts of the Constitution, guess what? They were printed! When they were debating the Constitution, the text in front of them was printed. But when it came time to write the Constitution, the Holy Constitution, it had to be handwritten, just like the Torah till today. 
the Torah has to be handwritten. So people argued whether to accept print or not, and Jews did too. But among the Jews, it was a very quick argument. It was settled very quickly, and Jews adopted print. They still said the Torah had to be written by hand, okay. Just like the Americans wrote the Constitution by hand. But other than that, yes, books, 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 books. And so, in Jewish culture, in the early modern period, we have a democratization of culture. Because once you have a book, anybody can read it. You can go into David Darshan's library, where he's the librarian, and sit and read the book. You could ask or not ask. If you think you understand it, you understand it. And no rabbi is going to tell you what to think. Because you've got the book. On the other hand, the rabbis do have something to say. And that's the Shulchan Aruch, the codification of Jewish law. Now, in the 16th century, it's not just Jewish law that's codified. French law is codified. Polish law is codified. There's a wave of codification, which is also connected to printing, where you take the laws and you say, OK, I'm making legal cookbooks. You want to know what the law is? Open it up, look at the right paragraph, boom, you know what the law is. Now, a lot of rabbis don't like this. What do you mean you know what the law is? How dare you? We're going to tell you what the law is. But because of printing, other rabbis say, wait a minute, we've got to get out there. We've got to be on the internet, so to speak. <laughs> If we want to get our message out, we have to get with it. And so we get the code of Jewish law, which comes out in two versions, the Sephardic and the Ashkenazic. First, the Sephardic, which is written by Yosef Karo. In Sfat, in the land of Israel, And then a Polish rabbi, Moshe Isserlis, who's referred to as Ramo of Ramu, Rav Moshe Isserlis. Rav Moshe Isserlis. He takes a look at this. He says, well, this is all fine and dandy, but uh, we do things differently here in Europe. So he attached to it glosses giving the Ashkenazic version. Together, these were printed together almost from the very beginning. The first Shulchan Aruch came out in 1565 by 1580 edition. And that became the standard code of Jewish law until today. We have another development, which is connected to um, printing, democratization of knowledge, uh, democratization of culture. What do you see here? Does anybody recognize this? This is in Prague. It's in the Pinkas Shul, the Pinkas Synagogue of Prague, which was remodeled in 1625. Remodeled, Raymond, 1625. When it was remodeled, they added this wall with this staircase and doorway and these rather large windows, which opened up into this room. What is this room? Women? Yes! <laughs> it is the Ezrat Nashim. 
Ezrat Nashim, the section for the women. Now, Ezrat Nashim doesn't have a very good reputation uh, in feminist circles. I think they're wrong. It's a very feminist institution. Why? Because from the late Middle Ages, there was a trend to get women out of the synagogue. Now, that's a subject for another lecture. But you'll have to take my word for it that from the 13th century on, there's a definite trend to find excuses why women should not be in the synagogue. They still come occasionally for special occasions to hear the shofar blow uh, for the priestly blessing, for special sermons, but basically, we'd rather not have them there. Again, if you look at Prague, what's the oldest synagogue in Prague? The Alt Neuschul. You've seen pictures, I'm sure, of the Alt Neuschul. Built in the 13th century. Guess what? There is no women's section. Today, there is a women's section. When was it built? In the 17th century. Our period. Why? Because if from the 13th century the trend is to get the women out of the synagogue, beginning in the late 16th century, the 17th century, we start bringing them back in. The first step is they have a place under the roof. They're in the building. Elvis is in the building. <laughs> Somebody understood that joke, okay. <laughs> Women are in the building. They have a place. They're not guests in the synagogue anymore. They belong here, which is why I say it's a feminist institution. And of course, you could look at the, the history of the synagogue over the last 400 years as the history of women getting closer and closer to the center until today we have women rabbis. It starts with the Ezrat Nashim. So that's another facet of democratization. And of course, with printing, we have books in Yiddish printed. And who can read Yiddish? Women. Women. And also men who don't know Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> but we pretend they don't exist. These were not much respected, actually. I'm sorry? These men weren't much respected, actually. Which is why we keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> but, and you didn't have to read, necessarily. You could be read, too. Right? So, women and uneducated men in fact, there's a Yiddish book printed in 1595 called the Brandspiegel. And it says on the uh, title page, this book is for women and men who are like women. <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? Uneducated. Uneducated. Low class men. So, people who were only observers before become more performers. If women were outside the synagogue, they're now inside the synagogue. And from facilitators, women were facilitators. Their job was to make sure the men could perform their obligations. Now they at least become informed facilitators. They know why they're doing what they're doing, because they can read about it or have it read to them. Okay. Lecture one is over. We'll continue. <laughs>